All right, welcome back to another episode of the Blasters and Blades podcast. So hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies, a place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. So without further ado, we're going to introduce you to our guest, the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Jay Parker. So Jay, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I was actually served in the Navy a long time ago, so I won't hold against your, your Army hijinks, you two. Um, <laughs> served in the Navy. It's okay, you're semen only. Getting, hey, you know, I ate shit, though, when I was in the Navy. I can swear, right? You're fine. Am I allowed to cuss in the show? Yeah, you're fine. Yeah. Yeah, anyways, they I used to cause trouble. So I, my Navy career was cut wicked short. I got caught in got caught in a chemical spill and got cancer twice from it and stuff. And so ended up, you know, up here where I'm living now and did some stuff for the Navy while I was up here, then got out, been doing game design since then pretty much. And then of course now I teach at a college and yeah. So I threw, I threw crap at the wall for the last, like, I don't know how many freaking years. And finally stuff started finally getting started to stick after a while, but I still don't have much for street creds and, that's fine because the more street creds you have, the more people come after you with pitchfork. So, fair enough. So, what did you do in the navy? I was a shit Sorry. chaser. I was a hull technician. Okay. So you scraped barnacles. So like a well, like a welder and whatever. I finished up doing force protection because they had nothing for me to do. So they're like, "What would you like to do?" I'm like, "Hey, what's this? What's this force protection stuff?" I'm like, "You have to because no one wants to do it." And I was like, "Okay." Not so like playing. Applied. Got reservists about how not to get kidnapped by terrorists and stuff if they're overseas. Nothing exciting though. I guess it depends on when you were serving whether that was exciting or not. But all right, so it was, it was right before I got out before nine eleven. So I went to reenlist. My wife's like, I was she's like, I'm not meant to be a Navy wife. I'm like, well, that's the end of that. So wives can be convincing like that. So the next part of the introduction, dear listener, as we tell how we first found them. So Seska, how did you find Mr. Jay Parker? So I found Jay last year doing um, games with Conda Couch, and he was the DM, and we were doing a Steve Rogers uh, campaign. Lots of fun. Uh, Jay and I hit it off in the I like to poke fun at him, and he pokes fun back kind of way. (laughs) So, and... um, he also really loved to always put my character in a love triangle with uh, his, with Katie, who was amazing. <laughs> like, so that's do. how we met. I actually first found you watching those games because Seska's like, I am not going to be like having no views on an episode I'm on, so you will watch all these things. So she had Nick and I watching the episodes. That's the other co-host who couldn't make it. He is a, uh, a law enforcement officer, and sometimes their job isn't done when they clock out, they've got to talk to the lawyers and do the copy things, you know, speeding tickets and whatnot. I don't know. He's going to get mad at me for saying that. <laughs> no, 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 no. He's just having a secret love affair with the donut shop. Possible, possible. But all See, right. I don't that... only pick on you, Jane. <laughs> on that happy note, Seth, you get to ask him the most important question. Oh, religion. Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? Firefly does not even out register on my radar, so that's not happening. How do we um, kick him again? Right. How do we kick him from this podcast again? Is there a button somewhere? <laughs> uh, that's a tough one because I, I grew up on Star Trek a lot, but I was always a big Star Wars fan. But I used to go to the Star Trek conventions, so it was kind of kind of weird. I dated this girl that was hardcore into Star Trek, so you kind of just did what she wanted, otherwise she'd kill you. Fair enough. So she was a badass. So I just kind of, her parents were always like, hey, we're going to a convention. And they kidnapped me and just dragged me all over the place. It was really cool, though, because I, I met lots of famous people that way. So that's how I met James Dewan. We, uh, I was getting his autograph, and people rushed the stage where he was signing autographs. So security stepped in, and he and I ended up sitting with each other for 45 minutes while they dispersed the crowd. Oh, my goodness. Oh, nice. They're like, well, you can't go. you can't go down. It's not safe. So he's like, "Oh, pull up a chair," and we sat and we talked about his family. Nice. Like, you're asking me Star Trek questions. You're not a Trekkie, are you? I'm like, well, not like these people. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's your favorite era of Star Trek? 
it would have to be the the first wave of movies. I'd say the so first the first three movies. So the red felt looking uniforms. Yeah, not once they hit Save the Humpback Whales, I was done. But and I don't think I get back into it until first until first contact. In first contact, I actually every time I watch it, ironically enough, I cry when I when I hear the opening music because I was going through experimental chemo and I watched like it was a played on loop at NIH. So every time I hear it, I get these flashbacks of like how awful I was feeling. It's like, oh no. It's like, no. yeah. If, I, if it's on, my wife's like, are you okay? I'm like, don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. This I'm having a moment. Music and get past this opening scene because I was so deathly sick. So I was like, I was, oh, it was bad. But that's, I kind of like, I got out of it and then I got back into it with First Contact, which was a brilliant, brilliant comeback of Star Trek, especially after that joke, generations. So. In Star Wars, I mean, I was always a, a tr original trilogy person, you know. And after that, I just kind of like, I mean, I stuck with it just because of Star Wars. But okay. So the next religion question is: I will say, I will say that it's when, when he talks about that music, it is kind of amazing what what a good soundtrack can do to add to an ambiance for a movie. I still get chills when I hear the uh, the theme song for the. Um, Oh, what's the name? I'm drawing a blank. Um, Last of the Mohicans, that intro music, like good good theme music can can evoke a lot of emotions. I almost wish we got to the point where our books could have like, the, or our games even, could like have theme music that plays when you open it. That would be awesome. Well, I, that's why I play Dragon Quest on my phone, so I can always have the Dragon Quest music playing. It's like, yeah, or Animal Crossing. It's like, <laughs> like yep. Yeah. Yeah, I need some Animal Crossing today, and I'm too cheap to buy the game, so I have it on my phone for free. Hit, hit, turn it on. It's like, oh, soundtrack. <laughs> We're easily impressed, Seska. Oh, you both are hilarious. But Tolkien, Potterverse, or Game of Thrones? You ready for this? Never read any of them and have no interest. Okay, I what's your fantasy genre go to? I'm a, I'm a horror person. I grew up on Stephen King while kids were reading kids are reading little kids books i was reading you know salem's lot and the shining and that explains so much second, about and i was doing that in second grade i was reading shakespeare and say in stephen king in second second grade that was my thing I and did that like explains so much <laughs> did you ever tell your teacher here's johnny <laughs> no no i i mean i pranked my teachers you know a little bit here and there i was like i was a good kid contrary to what my parents might have thought at the time but. <laughs> so would you say horror then is your first love? Horror is definitely my first love. Okay. Science fiction, science fiction, sort of after that, but drama, like a nice drama, you know. Okay. I know I'm on the science fiction. Th and the thing is, I have I'm a I write sci-fi games, but I'm not like your I'm not your standard standard. Well, what is it that you love about the science fiction genre? A space. I was always in, I was always fascinated with space. So you know, once I lost part of a lung, I'm like, well, never going on a shuttle. So that's the end of that. So you know, and, and that was always my thing. I mean, heck, in second grade or what was it? Was it first or second grade? I had a teacher yell at me because she's like, everything you draw is, is rocket ships in space. Why? That's awesome. Well, teachers teachers didn't want that. I, so I was told no, that wasn't cool. I mean, I. Most of my most of my childhood was classic science fiction and horror, so I could get away with science fiction because it was science fiction. So I could do science fiction horror. My parents didn't blink to that. So what is it that you love about horror? I like I like isolationism, the idea of being alone. <laughs> so COVID's been great. COVID's been fantastic. I mean, I've been in medical I've been in medical isolation for a month. So COVID's a walk in the park. People complain about being shut up at home. I'm like. Are you kidding? I got a refrigerator. It's like, f you guys. It's like I've got a refrigerator and I've got like all my stuff around me. It's better than being in a hospital room that's sterile and you can't have company. So it's like whatever. It's like this is this is a walk in the park. But but movies like you know the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Where even though there there are people, it's still you're isolated. Or in movies like even what was it? White Out with Kate Winslet, not uh, Kate Beckinsale there. It was an isolation movie. They were they were away from people, and okay. I kind of I like films like that where they're just away from people, away from civilization. Like zombie movies, they're so passe because it's like, oh look, it's like freaking zombies. 
It's like, yeah, yeah I don't particularly there. like zombies, but that's because they scare me. Zombies are overrated. So, but I mean, I grew up on Doctor Who too. So, <laughs> science fiction wise, Doctor Who is my was where it. But where who it really some, the Doctor Who has some horror in it too. A classic first episode of Doctor Who I ever saw was Earthshock. Gave me nightmares <laughs> forever. I still to this day have Cyberman nightmares. I have a Cyberman shrine in my house. Why? Because the, the best way to face your fears is to face them head on. Okay. So it's a reminder of how terrified I was of the Cybermen or Earthshock. Not to mention, it's the, first, it's the episode there where they kill Adric. So you hadn't had the death of a companion forever. So when he dies, it's like he realizes, wow, I'm really going to die. And the, and the doctor can't do anything to save him. And they blow so would you, would you consider horror to be part of the sci-fi and fantasy uh, milieu? Or would you consider it to be its own thing? I'd say its own thing. It's but everything can be dabbled across across the lines. I mean, so I think horror is a nice standalone. But you can have horror aspects in, in fantasy and um, in science fiction easily. So I mean, look at Pan, what Pandorum. Yeah. Pandorum on the spaceship. I mean, that was that was like a th psychological thriller, but it still had horror aspects to it. Yeah, Event Horizon. Event what? Event Horizon, the movie that gave me a stroke in the movie theaters. Did it really? And yeah. you do this to yourself for fun? Yeah. I, he likes I, pain. I wanted to get out of the hospital. I was so desperate to get out of isolation because I wanted to see Event Horizon. I got out the day it premiered and I had tickets. And I went straight to the theaters from the hospital. The hospital was trying to track me down because my potassium was 1.2. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm watching Event Horizon. And when he's in the, 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 the duck and his wife pops up, I had a stroke. When so she did you get finish the movie? Up, I was like, boom. They brought me back to the hospital and drooling on myself. I'm like, I didn't finish the freaking movie. Because <laughs> that was the important part. I think that yeah. that definitely gives you diehard fan points. Yeah, Event Horizon was was brilliant, brilliant horror because it was that that scare tactic with the sound and everything in the theaters. If you think about it, that was like everything was so quiet. Then boom, 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 and the sounds what got you. So. I will say the probably the scariest time I watched a movie was I watched um, Insidious on the parade field on a big inflatable screen. And it was like the movie <clears throat> that Mother Nature wanted to scare us that night because anytime when it like the thing came out to scare or startle you, the TV would suddenly move forward. This is this is when you make me feel really old because I was well out of the military after that. So, yeah, that definitely um, that got me for. A good while and uh including some of our friends who are like this isn't a scary movie and then they're like okay that was actually scary and the, on a parade field with no other lights yep <clears throat> so do you um think that when they remaster some of these old classics and they bring them into high definition so you can watch them on your you know uba whatever tv screen i'm not a techie obviously um uh, do you think it can recapture some of that that experience that you got when you watched it in the theater the first time, or or does it lose it when it's not uh, in its original format? Lose it tends to lose it because if you look at Salem's Lot, the the TV movie they had, the good one way back in the day, that movie was terrifying. But if you think about it, most of us watch it on a snowy TV. So yeah. when you watch it in HD, it just loses the effects. You know, even watching like I was watching GI Joe, the GI Joe live action that they did yesterday and it's like wow this movie's crap because in hd everything everything all the faults show but back in the day they didn't show so when you remaster stuff i mean even as I was, I was showing a clip of star wars to my students yesterday you know master yoda do not or do or do not there is no try and it was in it was in hd and it's like wow this looks really stupid you can see luke skywalker's complexion like plain as day and i'm like i don't care and the yoda looks like a puppet like looks like a puppet puppet, not just, hey, it's no, it looks stupid. So yeah, I think yeah. when you hit, once you hit HD, you and you remaster stuff, you run risk of actually ruining the effect that the film itself had. Yeah, I know when they redid some of the Star Trek episodes from the original, where uh, they did a, a an episode of with DS9 and involving the original footage, they said they actually took it all the way up and then they dialed it back because you could start seeing like coffee stains and stuff and they went and it looked bad. So they had to <laughs> dial the footage back some. Yeah, at least they didn't have the modern crappy too. 
At least they didn't have like modern water bottles accidentally left on the fantasy side. I don't know. One more do that. Know, Starbucks cups. Yeah. <laughs> no hate. We're just laughing with you. We're laughing with you. Game of Thrones. No, we should hate. We should hate. Hate's good. Hate's the path to the dark side. And that, therein lies the horror movie for you. Jr. Um, are you going to ask him about his brain, his memories? There we go. All right. So. The it's been, uh, it's been a long day. We got distracted talking about horror and having heart attacks in movie theaters. That's hardcore, by the way, sir. So you get a cookie. Uh, so what's your first memory <laughs> of engaging in science fiction or fantasy as a genre? Uh, was it uh, was it the the game? Was it a book you read? Um, wh what was your very first memory that you can, you can think about? Blasters firing as the as the bulkhead explodes in Star Wars, the, the very first Star Wars movie at the drive at the drive in theater scared the shit out of me and I ended up jumping under the seat and hiding behind the seat for the rest of the movie and bawled like a baby when Obi Wan Kenobi got whacked. <gasps> Spoiler that was alert! First experience of Star Wars of science fiction at all, and after that I was freaking hooked. It made me cry like a little girl. I loved it. Yeah, well, he just, is yeah, a horror was, junkie. I think I was like what two or three years old when it came out. So Aww. I still remember because I remember the explosion. Now when I watch it today, I cannot do nothing but laugh. It's like die, die. <laughs> All right, so maybe we talk to that counselor about those horror uh, obsessions. But so speaking of games, you're clearly here as a, as an RPG game designer. So how did your love of the genres of science fiction, fantasy, and, and horror transitioning into you writing stories in it? Because let's face it, games are basically stories in action. Well, my my brother got my brother used to play D and D with his friends. You know, when I was a kid, and they never let me play. And like, well, play Marvel because I was a big comic book fan. So cool. they got me into the Marvel role playing game. And then from there, my business my business partner today, he and I started gaming a lot to the point where my friends and Boy Scouts would come over, and we game like straight through the weekend and not go to bed. So you would go twenty four to forty eight hours straight of nonstop gaming. And when I got out of the military, my business partner came back up to Maine. You know, we're like, let's start a company and we'll, we'll do game design. And so literally with a tax return, I used all the money invested in a small publishing company and we just launched the company and we started doing game design and stuff. And I was going to school for for my English degree. I know I was a welder in the Navy and I'll go to school for English. Explain that one. And wow. um, I wasn't like a, I wasn't a prolific writer or anything. I wasn't anything fantastic. And then I got picked up. I was doing stuff for for Artel Sorian writing for Cyberpunk V3, which they don't talk about, like no one talks about anymore, mostly because it's probably the most offensive shit that's ever been published for Cyberpunk. Matter of fact, when they talk about the bad stuff of Cyberpunk, it's my stuff that gets thrown up on the screen quickly. <laughs> so it's been, How do you feel been, about that? You know what? Cyberpunk isn't isn't preschool stuff. I'm sorry. You can't <laughs> you can't write Cyberpunk with mittens. So so I got into basically I, I met Mike Pondsmith through James Carpio who was doing Icon at the time and and um, Peter Bryan and I both both met Mike and so I was writing for him and then I started writing for Doctor Who doing Cyberman writing go figure for the Adventures in Time and Space game and then after that I just I I just started writing my own stuff and I kept doing it like I said I kept throwing stuff at the wall and hope something st stuck and then that's eventually my superhero game you know took off and. I've been writing that ever since, and now the the Subtralians thing that's premiering at GaryCon this weekend that uses my G Core system. So, so that's we're gonna get to that because it is awesome stuff. I enjoyed it. I and to be honest, listener, I did do some play testing with him for it. It was so much fun. Yeah, and so, we don't have to give her a walk in the park either because she's Cisco. But I did get to blow stuff up. And you didn't that's die. Always fun. Was pretty you didn't die. Um, so many creative types have let their own real life experiences influence the kind of stories and they tell and games they design. So were there any specific formidable moments that, that shaped the kind of games that you put out there? All my games, everything I write is always hardcore, gritty horror. I mean, even my, I mean, I, I wrote a thousand page superhero setting. 90% of it is, is subject matter that people don't want to, don't want to write about because it's too edgy. and It's too, it's not something that people want to deal with. I mean, I got, a, I got a job offer at DigiPen, right, to teach, like intro to college writing. Pondsmith calls me at midnight one night, and he's like, hey, I got a job for you. Do you want this job at DigiPen? 
and they they were reading my bios from a game I written. I had one game with a supervillain. He was a supervillain because his wife went and got an abortion when she realized that their child was going to have uncanny powers. And she was terrified of the superhuman and didn't know her husband had those genes. And he's like, you wrote about someone having an abortion over this. He's like, who does that? It's like real people. Real people go through these situations. It's like, so everything I write, it has to be based in some type of realism. Even the fantastic has to have something that you can relate to. Every character I write about, I spend at least an hour walking through their shoes in my head before I sit down to write a bio. Because I want the reader in, to understand what it feels like to be that person. Or what the villain, what they're feeling when they are doing the evil that they do. Because evil just doesn't happen. Evil happens for a reason. So, so were you Team Empire or Rebel? In the prequels, completely Team Empire. In the in the sequel, in the original, I don't know. I really don't know. I I I still was. I probably would have been still Team Empire, just because, at least with the Empire, they were keeping trying to keep as much as the crime syndicates in control as they could. Which, if you look at the little people, if you were living in the inner worlds, that you benefit you better. So, fair enough. And if you got in a gunfight, you're more likely to win with the Empire as your enemy. So, made sense to keep them in power. Yep. So, I mean, heck, I'm the guy who supported the snap. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, speaking of uh, military science fiction, your bio and you mentioned that you served in the U.S. Navy. So, we ask all the creative types we interview. Um, how do you feel like your time in the Navy affects the stories you tell? Going through cancer twice and experimental chemo with being in the military where you don't get the civilian treatment that civilians get would be, you know, oh, you know, compassion and whatever. No, no, it was get your chemo, get your ass to the, the transient barracks and be sick until you're ready for your next round of chemo. And that's kind of like what, what it was like. The advantage was I was able to finally just travel and come back to Maine to to be with my family and stuff while I was sick. But I think that it taught me, there were a lot of lessons I learned in being in the Navy. The biggest one was, is that I valued the traditions. So when I got out of the hospital, I mean, I was like a skeleton. I was 154 pounds. No one would, no one would do, like, they didn't want me working out because they afraid I was going to hurt myself. So when I made Petty Officer, I'm like, I wanted them to attack my crow on, and no one would. So SEAL, I think SEAL Team 5 was visiting for a training exercise with the Coast Guard. And so I went to the dive locker and my like, guys, I made petty officer and no one will tack my crow on. It's like, I earned this. I was sick and I died. It's like, I, I earned this privilege. Please tack my crow on. So I had a SEAL team tack my crow on with a crowbar. So can you explain what that is for those of us who are so when, you make petty, when you make petty officer, all your shipmates are supposed to punch your, your crow on your uniform. Okay. And they basically punch your arm. They all take turns wailing on you, you know. And it's a, it's it's a baptism thing when you make petty officer. And I no, no. To be, I earned it. We, we we had a similar tradition when I was in where it was punch rank, and they would, especially when the um, nobody would ever do it to me, and I'm and I'm not going to complain because for women the rank is right here. <laughs> So I don't well, really you were know. you were in at a different time. So when I was in, and they had the BDU still, your rank went on your collars, and so and they had little pins until you got it uh, sewed on. So they pull the backing off those little pins, and when they punch your rank on your collar, you're driving those spikes right into your collarbone. Yeah, that's, that's army life, though. Yeah, and no, they, they maybe we're a little bit more sophisticated. Yeah, one of my friends had it on his uh, sternum, and his sternum was he he was in a big company. And he had a bunch of friends, and they all <laughs> it, it was soft. Jeez. Uh, yeah. Good times. He good was times. very proud of that. I was looking at him as a medic and going, "That's not supposed to be soft." I mean, over overall, you know, when it comes to when it comes to my navy experience, it built character. And the reality is, is everything I went through, I was able to survive. And it, like like Launchpad McQuack says, anything you walk away from is a good thing. And he crashed. And so I, I took all the experience of the good and the bad. And I mean, did it influence my writing? Probably not other than a much more laissez-faire of my approach about things. Because once you've been through what I've been through, there ain't, there ain't nothing more unless you just die. So I just 
It's like whatever. I mean, I was I was I was really sick. So you just luckily my shipmates and when I finished up in Portland were pretty cool to me. So I had that benefit. Of course, my my brother my brother made the officer right when I was getting out. So he's like, I'm gonna get you to salute me, and I actually get out before I had to salute him. So, but now now he's a he's a commander in the I think he's a commander in the navy or lieutenant commander. He'll kill me if he watches this. And I get the rank wrong. I apologize, dude. He's out. He's out at sea right now with the admiral. So it's like, but it's just like you know, he's smarter than I am. Anyways, I mean, he, he'll freaking brilliant guy. So it was nice that I get out before, so I would never have to salute him because yeah, we competed on a lot. So yeah, he beat me. Always beat me. So. Physically, and in rank. <laughs> <laughs> so you ever draw on people you knew in the military when you're designing game characters? No, no, no. I most of my most of my shipmates have gone their way, and and none of them none of them are as ruthless as the characters I write about. They're all really good people. So I've played against some of your villains. Oh my goodness, some of them are a little trippy. And uh, so, does your time in the service affect the kinds of stories you write, or and things that you engage with as a consumer, you, your games as well? Sorry. No, no. I mean, because no. no, I mean, really, I mean, like I said, after after being sick the way I've been sick, it's like, you know, it's just that Trump's Navy, right? It, it does. I mean, I was I was active duty at the time, so I made petty officer. I think a month after I got out of medical isolation, and I answered all the questions backwards because I was a welder, but I worked in a carpentry shop, right? So everything you wouldn't do on a on a wooden ship is what you do on a metal ship. So I answered all the questions backwards and actually did quite well. They're like, "How did you get all these questions right?" It's like you haven't worked your rate in like what two years now. I'm like, "Yeah." It's like, and so I made pay offs, and they, they didn't argue, they didn't argue or anything with me. They're you're good. So, oh, the cancer card. No, I didn't play my cancer card. I was ashamed of, of having been sick like I was, and I tried to reenlist, and they're like, "No, you're done." And I begged, and I begged, and I begged, and they would not let me stay. So that's a hard thing to deal with. I got that when I got my discharge too. Yeah. When you want to keep serving, but they say, "Nope, your body is broken, and we don't need you anymore." That's a that's a hard thing to hear as a young man. When they cracked my chest open, they said you can't go to sea anymore. And when they took out part of my lung the second time, they're like, "You're done." I even tried. They said, "If you can pass the PRT, we'll let you stay longer." And I had to be rescued from a pool, and I used to be a diver. Ooh, yeah, that's nice. that's a bad sign. So but you're here now, out. telling awesome games, scaring the heck out of little kids, probably. So that, there's that. So you know. No, I know. Uh, I I teach. I teach. So it, it kind of it compensates for the the loss and. I mess with the criminal justice students and I, I terrify them. So that's good. They need it. Uh, so switching kind of gears from talking about you, yep. well, precisely about you and talking more about fan stuff. Have you had any cool fan art or cosplay of something from a game you've done? No. Okay. If, unless you count someone dressing as a Cyberman somewhere in, in England, probably. I don't, I don't know. No, no. We'll totally count that. I, so, I, I, um, has anybody ever asked for your autograph in public away from a convention? Nope. Nope. Y you sure it's not on that drop ad form? I, I literally, like, <laughs> I, people people don't even know what state I live in normally. So, my, my social media says I live somewhere else. It used to Fair say enough. I had more away for the longest time. I changed it. <laughs> I was like, I don't so, know. have you ever spotted somebody out in the wild playing one of the games that you've worked on? Like at a game shop or something? Or your properties. No. Have you ever spotted them somewhere? Like the stuff I've worked on? Oh, Doctor Who stuff everywhere, but so. Cyber I saw Cyberpunk Red like one in one bookstore. I haven't seen it since. It's did like, you okay. did you sign it while you were there? You know, the thing is, no, I because I didn't have a pen on me, so well that's rough. I'd have gone and asked for one. I'm like, this is my book. It's mine. Yeah. JR no. loves attention. I don't, even, I don't even. I unless I ask to come down to a, a book, a game store, and sign stuff. I I rarely get invites to do anything. Like, I I am so far a black sheep in the industry that I'm surprised. I'm surprised Flint even even saw me as a blip when when I popped up. Other than I was the only person who knew how to run top secret SI. 
So, so, um, do you have any weird, funny stories about interacting with a fan or get somebody at a convention even? First convention I went to was an icon in Long Island and James mm -hmm. Carver invited us down. And, and so I'm standing there at, at this like after party with all these people and this guy comes up and he's like, you're, you're, you're Jay Blank. And of course I changed my name since then. So I, I use the last name from that. But I was like, yeah. And he's like, oh, I got your game. I was like, oh, cool. It's like, you like it? He's like, yeah, yeah. He's like, God, this is great. You're, he's like, can I get your beer? I'm like, because I'm a recovered alcoholic. I'm like, oh, no, I'm good. So I was actually standing next to a famous actor because he and I were talking about a movie, I think the movie Eraser that he was in. And so he's like, Yo, you're like one of us. I was like, no, not really. He's like, what do you mean? It's like, dude, I got a life and I use deodorant. And the kid just, the guy, the guy's like, he pauses. The actor looks at me and smirks. And he, the guy's like, I'm sorry. And it's like, oh, that's good, dude. Probably go put some deodorant on. He walked off. And the guy's like, is it always this bad? I'm like, I don't know. This is my first convention. I thought you'd have the answer to this. He's like, no, I do not have an answer to this. So, ah. so Jay Parker says wear deodorant when you meet him at a convention. Got In it. front of all my game books, it says you have to have good hygiene or don't don't touch my game. So, oh, I have oh, hygiene God. rules. Got to be got to at least be like not smelling bad to play in my games, or to play my games or own or, or own them. I mean, come on. Let's use no hygiene. wonder, no many people, not many people have them. There's so many rules. <laughs> the only important rule I care about. You can BS the rest of it. So salty. Okay. So this is the part where we talk about everything you have created, Jay. So what are the highlights you're known for? Um. Oh, let's see here. As I as I dump a whole bunch of superhero figures off of this, I'm famous for this. Oh, yay. But of course, that doesn't really matter because the only thing people really give a shit about these days is this thing. So, um, I don't know. Cyberpunk Red sells or whatever. I don't know. And I, I worked on Red and I worked on the Chromebook and stuff. I, I don't hear much about it, to be honest with you. I'm kind of like, I'm like, literally, I'm like in the broom closet. So I only get called when shit needs to get done. And then I go back in the room closet. That's kind of like all I ever do. So, so I, I run my own company with Jason McKinney and, and we do G core X, which has great. It's just going to get out of your system. You're a semen in the closet. Uh-huh. Pretty much. I'm like, I'm like that, that stained blouse there. <laughs> Only ends up on eBay. Okay. So, so there's that. Like Doctor Who, I actually take the Doctor Who Adventures in Time and Space book up to the college where I teach on open house days just to get people to come by our table. Because people know role playing games, but they don't know like you. Know, most kids don't give a crap about classic literature anymore or poetry unless it's like some political political thing that goes with it. So, it's like you know my department chair was like. How do you get people to come to the table? It's like I give away free gaming dice and I put a Doctor Who book on the table, and that's all you need. You'll draw in all the nerds, and after that, I can pick out every all the other people that would never go to humanities table and tell them why do you need our department? Why do you need to be here? So, but yeah, so there's that. I did a I did a free GI Joe role playing game using the fusion system back in the day. So we used to run that at conventions. I mean, we used to have 20, 20 people playing and stuff. Um, when I go to TotalCon in Massachusetts, I run a G Core Kids Marvel game for, and that thing used to be all kids, and now it's like you know, twenty freaking adults along with some kids playing. <laughs> when we have like full tables going, we had one game where we ran a Transformers Marvel game, and we had we had to have a second GM just to run the thing because it was just like it was so huge. So. I did the skill list for top secret new new world order. Um, I've done random art for fireside creations and stuff. And then, um, yeah, that's about it. I mean, it's just usually just do my own stuff. I, I rarely work for other people. So uh, our tell story has me on retainer. So when they call, I just drop what I do and do whatever. And I've been working with Flint Dilly on subterraneans, which will show on Saturday and stuff. 
been working on that, I think, for three months now. And I took all his notes that he had, like TV pitches, video game notes and everything, and built this one massive like game, basically a property universe out of all his notes. So now he's out there all he's out there talking about it and stuff. So which is so, great because he starts talking about it and it's like, wait a second, that's not what we so I have to quickly run back in and change stuff. So, you know, that's what happens when somebody speaks that has creative power. So because I know who Flint is, but I don't think JR knows who Flint is. And so just so people have the context of who Flint Dilly is. Yes. Flint Dilly is the guy who made everybody cry in the Transformers animated movie by killing off Optimus Prime. And he wrote Transformers, the original series. He wrote some G.I. Joe. Um, he wrote a bunch of video games, it's a really crappy horror movie, which I will not name. Sorry, Flint. I tried watching it, dude. It sucked. <laughs> but I think it was because it was a B movie. So what? that wasn't his fault. You're not uh, supposed to watch those sober. Yeah, see, I don't drink anymore, so I can't watch anything. See? That's why you're going to watch them. <laughs> so... So, but he's he's done like tons of stuff. He's done lots of cool stuff. I mean, he did Agent Thirteen. He did the but he he did a lot of the Buck Rogers stuff with Mike Pondsmith and and whatnot. So, I mean, he just when it comes to he's like full of ideas, like constantly going. So, I think that's the big thing that that's just been going right now. It's like I built the world for him using all his notes, and then now it's going back and making sure it's like exactly what he wants. And because he's he's now he's it's thirty years old, so I've updated it. So now he's like he's trying to catch up to all my updates. So he'll th he'll throw stuff at me. I'm like, go to this page. It's there. He'll throw something else. Go to this page. It's there. How about this? Oh, that's a good idea. I go look in the file. No, I have that too. So it's neat because when Pondsmith used to give me art assignments, he just give me the art assignment. Actually, even with the writing assignments too, he used to give me the basics of what he wanted, and he'd never have to go back to it. Because he's like, this is this is what I want, and Flint for some for some reason, he and I are on this weird, and I don't even know him that well. I mean, I just know him through through Pondsmith. Like we have this weird creative wavelength where it's like, it's like, oh, you did that. I'm like, yep. How about this? Yep. Did you do this? Yep. Would it be too much to ask if you put this in? I'm like, yeah, but you told me to take that out. Could you put it back in? I'm like, yep. And so. <laughs> So at one point, I think we had three different subterranean files going with stuff he kept saying, take out, put in, take out, put in. So I just kept two files running just in case. So it's it now, of course, Cisco played in the in the, one of the play tests. And so now we've got it to a point where it's like, okay, can this be a functional game? And so we've played it. We've played it with the, the battle suits that Cisco and, and company played with, with Kate. We played it with um, the characters from the TV show with another group. We played it with Mercenaries, which we'll be running at GaryCon as well. And then we played a survival horror scenario just because I had this. I was in the shower. I'm thinking this would be a great horror thing because the idea of Subterraliens wasn't just to build the world. It's build it for TV, car, TV movies, like everything you possibly can market it for and make sure it's all there. And so I was like, can you, can you run this as a horror thing? Can it be a horror TV show? And so we ran a horror scenario, and the guy playing is like, "Dude, this is this is actually this is good horror." He's like, "You can actually play this game as a horror game." It's like, "Yep." He's like, that's he's like, "You can play it like four different ways with the same exact monster played out through these." He's like, "Yep." He's like, "That's that's different." So can't wait to show that off. I'm excited. So you mentioned earlier that something was played using your G-Core system? What is that? G-Core is um, it's a role-playing game based on the old Marvel face rip system, like a role-playing game mechanic or whatever. So Phil Reed, back in the day, did this thing where he, he held face rip for ransom. And so everyone put money in, and he updated it. Well, when he updated it, people were just, like, dumping. It was free for anyone to use, and people were just dumping, like, rehashes of the rules over. Like, when, when three the OGL came out, right, everyone just put out all these, like, crap, like, reprints of the rules over and over. So they started doing that with, with this face rope thing that Phil Reed did. It's like, you know, I'm done with this shit. So I went off, I went off, took elements of it, streamlined it without tables, and then it sold, like, really well. I'm like, oh. So then we fixed it, cleaned it up, and did it, sold it. Put a new edition out. Sold well. And it was like, yeah. So we put another edition out that we cleaned up even more. 
And then finally, I'm like, you know, we're coming up the 10 year anniversary of this stupid thing. I probably should give it the professional makeover. So I went through, read the whole thing. I'm like, wow, look at all the mistakes in here that my wife missed because my wife edits, but she did. She's not a gamer. So, and and she's a great editor, by the way. If I didn't have her editing my stuff, we'd have even more problems. So I went through and cleaned it up, and we put it out there in print on drive through, which is not something we normally do, just to see if it would sell, and it started selling. And then the 300-page setting books I did that all fit together into a 1,000-page book, those started selling. And so people were like, why don't you do Buck Rogers in G-Core? And I'm like, I'm not self-serving. I, I'm not going to do that. It's like Flint has Buck Rogers. I'm gonna do, we're going to do this right. And Cisco played. And we found that the the role-playing game, the original one, just doesn't do well on a stream. So we had to rebuild the rules. And then we built the rules, and they were much quicker and easier stream-wise. They were really fun. I was really impressed with how you guys did it because it only used a D10. Yeah. So. So what do you mean it didn't do well on a screen? Because because I'm not familiar with, with AD&D in D&D 2nd Edition. Because, wait, wait, wait. JR, do you want to calculate Thaco? I mean, I've had to learn. Yeah. yeah I'm not a I, math guy. James Ward taught me. <laughs> yeah, Luke, Luke Gygax had to correct me during while I was running Buck Rogers. About that that was actually very hilarious. You handled yeah, it very was. well. But the thing is, that wasn't my game. It never, it never was. But no one was, no one was up, no one had the book to run the stupid thing. <laughs> and so I was like, I'll run it for you. And the next thing I know, Flint's got me actually expanding out the TSR Buck Rogers universe. So that's where. Cisco, someday we'll, when all the legal stuff is over, maybe we'll get back to doing Buck Rogers so you can actually play your your whole thing I built just for your freaking character. Yes, so, I got to play Princess Amidala. It was wonderfully fun. So oh, the no, TSR, no, Ardella, not Amidala, dorkoid. Miss <laughs> Star Wars up with Buck Rogers. What the feck? Even I know better than that. So you said I'm not old enough to have watched the show. Okay, I'll give you that. I am that old. So when you said that TSR owns it, is it the original TSR or the one that somebody revived and started publishing under recently? Uh, the original, the original TSR. So Wizards of the Coast that owns it? No, it was um, it was before Wizards of the Coast. So when Wizards of the Coast took over, that was the end of Buck Rogers at TSR. So okay, um, I'm, I'm slowly learning that side of the business. I've made some friends that are into the whole publishing side. So yeah. speaking of RPG, so what is it that makes your game special? What makes your RPG stand out in the crowded field you're competing in? It's easy to play, and you don't have to buy a bunch of books to use it. My rule is, like, I grew I grew up, like, not well off. Like, my family, you know, my dad my dad got messed over by a business partner, and we spent a lot of time, my parents working for grueling hours. We didn't have money for anything, any, you know, what I have now would be considered living like a king compared to what I had growing up. So I wanted to make sure that my fans could afford, would only have to buy like one book. And so you're getting a ridiculous amount of money. I don't make, I barely make, I think I make a dollar or two off of each book sold because I refuse to put the price any higher because I don't, I mean, I remember it was like not having money. So when a kid buys my book or if you spend the 25 bucks on the book, you're getting everything you need and that you will ever need to play the game. Anything that after mean, that that I put out, their modules for the setting, you don't need those because the actually the the book itself has everything you need to build anything you want. Right down to psychological profiling. I mean the, the whole nine yards. So you can play it really ultra simple. Matter of fact, in the back of the book, there's actually a kids page. How do you run this game for little kids? And it's character creation for kids. Nice. So you have all the gritty stuff, and then in the back of the book, there's a section for kids. That's adorable. That's that's a great considering list. you're a horror person. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, got, I mean, my, my daughters grew up <laughs> testing all my stuff. I mean, we'd, we'd sit around at the dining room table, and we'd, we'd go to 7-Eleven, get slushies, and then we'd game all afternoon, play testing rules. That's awesome. So, I mean, all my stuff, I mean, my daughters play tested everything. So you can't just have a game. Like, you can't be a game designer and not have stuff for you, stuff that's kid-friendly. And G-Core was the one that, that did it. And kids play it at TotalCon, so why why not have it be kid accessible? Now, granted, there's powers like detachable penis in the game. 
Probably not one you use with kids. No. Do you know what the reference is, though? No. King no. Missile. King Missile saw the detachable penis. Go watch it on YouTube. I'm so if you play an undead body. character, you have this thing called detachable penis. It means your body parts can fall off because you're dead. Uh, you're you're undead. Okay. Okay. Yeah, all so right. This is where all of a sudden people are like, wait, what? And they're going to go back and actually look at the game. People did reviews reviews of the game, and no one caught it. I'm like, are you kidding me? That was my pride and joy. And that was my hat tip to King Missile. Your detachable penis is your pride and joy. Just live with that sentence for a minute. All right. So as a designer, you you create how do you go about creating an immersive world without stunning the role of the game master and the player in when it comes to universe creation? Okay, so making a game immersive. So you obviously have to create a game that the, the world you create is immersive. How do you do that without also stunting the, and not stunting the ability of the game uh, the game master at the table and the player to still feel like it's theirs? Well, I mean, if you're if you're playing like G Core is like it's open setting, so you can just create whatever setting you want. The setting books I have are actually for the Guardian Universe, which is a, a campaign we played back in the eighties that we just kept playing straight through until I think late the late nineteen nineties. I think is where we finally like slowed it down. And then that's when we started the company. So then it just became a company thing instead. But I did a game called Chronicle Double Zero, which was like, a, it was a cyber biopunk game. So when Pondsmith was still working for Digipin, I think, he was, getting, he was getting ready to wind down. So before cyberpunk, you know, 2077 and all that, I was doing this game. I was like, do you mind if I do this? Cause you're not doing any of this stuff. He's like, oh, that's fine. So. I had a I had a guy come up to review it, and he's like, "Dude, this is like one of the most immersive games I've ever played." In. He's like, "You've got this game where you literally feel like you're in the world, and and, and you leave it open for tons." I mean, even in my in my GU setting, there's tons of stuff open. It's like, here's the core teams, but here are the teams where they're they're always filling in the ranks. So there's always these blank spots, like question mark spots, where here you can play with this team. Here you can do this, or here's what the here's what an adventure would be with these, you know, this type of gameplay, you know, from street level to cosmic. So it just it leaves these huge spots open for the game master to run any scenario. So either they can build their own world, which I encourage you to buy G Core and do that, or buy the Guardian Universe stuff I publish and and use that world, which has tons of material. I mean, look, a thousand pages for for a setting, that's that's a lot of material. So, so how before we get into some more of this, but what how do you think that technology has changed how we're doing the gaming? Well, we're all doing this right now, and I've been running Zoom games since the, the quarantine. So, I can thank the college for paying for Zoom for all the faculty. So, <laughs> well, and you know what the nice thing is, you don't know if they took a bath and used deodorant or not. That's true, and and when Cisco when Cisco's being extra, extra um, <clears throat> how do we put extra character, um, charismatic? I guess you can accidentally <laughs> hit the mute button on her and not have to hear it. But Which everybody I've, loves I've, me. I've never had a mute. I've never muted anybody in in the Con and Couch games. No, I don't think you've actually ever muted me. No, I mute my students all the time. So. Well, you know, that is joyous. Well, when their dogs are barking in the background and stuff, and you're like, can you please do that? But I think f to get to answer your question, technology, it's great that we have this ability to play online because people are complaining about, oh, we don't have any socialization. I'm sorry. When I was in the hospital, we had no socialization. I mean, I get, I could have certain visitors, but they all had to be medically screened before they could enter my room. Aww. So if someone wasn't feeling well, no, they weren't coming in. And all I had was Spice Girls and Hanson and, and Dave Matthews. And no hot nurses. Actually, I had uh, one of my nuns was one of my nuns that used to come in and hold my hand. She was pretty cute. <laughs> so go to hell for that. Sister Mary. Oh man. She held my hand while I watched a program on exorcisms. She's such a sweetheart. Were you so afraid? You said I'll a few Hail Marys for this one. 
she was she was really nice though i i felt i actually when she would leave the room and i like check her out i'm like i feel really bad about this because like she was so kind to me so you know of course now i'm, I'm much older today and i'm not as much of a male pig because i got all kids all daughters so but it was just like yeah and i had cute nurses i mean heck my my girlfriend at the time her her next door neighbor was my cna and i ended up collapsing in a shower naked and she came running in i had my hands between my legs and i'm like can you help me out of the shower and she wouldn't help me out because i was naked and she left me in the shower with cold water pouring on me <laughs> while she went get a nurse so yeah so do you when you design games do you design them differently knowing that some of the play is going to be over like a zoom type screen or do you think it doesn't affect things to that degree it doesn't affect it doesn't affect it all because all the mechanics are real easy Okay, um, so when it comes to okay, I'm sorry, I'm covering because Siska's got some some. Um, That's okay. IRL so, interruption. So, so Siska's Siska's son, ask for the tablet. Go say I want the iPad. I'll stay out of trouble. He already <laughs> had it. <laughs> He's craving cookies now. Oh, give him a cookie. I don't have to deal with him. Give him as much sugar as he wants. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Tesco. The next question is uh, twenty-five. Um, what type of genre or subgenre do you think best translates into the gaming medium? Or science fiction is just <laughs> science fiction. Like people like look at steampunk, right? People like oh, ste it's so passe because everyone does it. It's like fantasy, right? And even superhero stuff. It's just like so many people do superhero, steampunk, fantasy. I mean. You put a game out, you're lucky if anyone even sees it. And then when you say horror, everyone's like, oh, it's Call of Cthulhu or nothing. It's like, okay, then nothing then. I mean, I, I find horror translates well. It translates well if your game master has an IQ above five. It has a bit of an imagination. Because you can terrify anybody. All you have to do is apply yourself. It's like Bob Ross. There's no such thing as a mistake. It's a happy murder. <laughs> Somehow I don't think there you go. Off, That's the quote from the show. There's a happy an murder. murder. Something an almighty murder right here. I bet he's the one that started that meme that uh, Bob Ross was a serial killer and all of his paintings were locations where he hit the bodies. No, no, I I just started watching Bob Ross like last week. Matter of fact, now I don't get to watch horror movies at night because my wife wants to watch Bob Ross before bed instead. I am yeah. certain that is very soothing for somebody without as damaged a psyche as yours. I wonder if the people that had Bob Ross as their drill sergeant feel the same way about him being so soothing as we do. <laughs> <laughs> he was a, I understand he was a hard ass when he was a sergeant in the Air Force. In Air Force? Really yeah. Freaking count. <sighs> so. Bad, this bad as a Coast Guard before 9-11. Before Okay, we're going to um, save you from yourself and Seska. Ask the next question. <laughs> um, is there anything that, well, we've kind of talked about what makes it ideal, but you are you keep talking about subterranean aliens. What is it that makes that super neat and special for you? Other than the, you talked about how you're going with the mediums so that it can be infinitely marketable. But other than that, what's really neat and special about it? Like, why yeah. am I going to want to pick up that and play it? Well, Other than the, good I thing is, the good thing is you mess the name up, so that's even better, which means you won't buy the right book anyways. So. <laughs> <laughs> subtra, subtra aliens. I know it took me a while to get it right. Even spelling it was a pain in the ass for the longest time. What makes it different different than all the other like Hollow Worlds type stuff out there? Yes. Yeah. Someone actually mentioned this on Flint's page, and I was like, well, for one, it's nothing like you just said your stuff is because we, we don't follow the rehashed tropes. Like, subtrailians is not the tropey thing that people think it is. Or even the way Flint describes it, it is not that way. So Flint has just got, when Flint talks about it, he's talking about the inspirations for where his ideas for that and, and like, in humanoids came from and whatnot. But what we've turned subtrailians into is something far off the beaten path. Um, Content-wise, I can't really go into detail because I don't know how much we want to talk about. Well, we don't want to give anything too much away. Yeah, but it's it's com more comparable to like a medical thriller with with elements of kaiju and 
and like Indiana Jones archaeology type stuff. I mean, and throw and throw in some bubblegum crisis battle suits. So I mean, I loved playing the uh, bubblegum crisis, and I bubblegum crisis is one of my all time favorite animes. So I really did love that. Well, which one though? The actual, the real good one, or that yes. crap one that with the thirty something episodes? Yes. The thirty episode one. I have both. That was stupid. The the eight the eight episode one was brilliant because all the stories interconnected. I, I enjoy it. You could you could feel bad for all the side characters and everybody that died in the original series because they they revisited those characters and the the events later on in the series. Whereas the the thirty episode one was just like it was like oh look we're gonna try to make it more trendy for the the anime kids and it's like oh what did you do the soundtrack alone for Bubblegum Crisis is just epic. You know, I love the soundtrack, and I had a roommate in college who hated anything that was not like American country, but I don't particularly I jive for rap, so I played the Bubblegum Crisis soundtrack, and every time she left the room. Oh, the Mad Machine is like one of the greatest freaking songs from the whole series, especially if you watched it on VHS when they showed the trailer for the next episode, and Mad Machine was the soundtrack to the trailer. That just made you really want to watch it. So when the role playing game came out, I'm like, I was on that. I'm like, I gotta have this. And we played it all the time here at the house. So so it's it really has a nice it's Subterraleans has has a very interesting collection of, of sub themes and stuff that fit together in a way that you don't see in other games. So it's not just a playability factor, it's actually content. Uh, I, I research a lot of stuff to make sure that we did not do anything that people have done before. Because I, I don't want to do, do some stupid rehash trope thing. I mean, it's stupid. So when you're premiering at a GaryCon, and then hopefully we'll see like a rules manual. Yeah, we're going to put We have a quick start thing done. So so Livio um, Rem, Remaldi, I think. Oh, oh, so Livio, I'm sorry if I messed your name up, dude. He did the, he did the art for Transformers for IDW. Mm -hmm. So he did a couple pieces of art for us, or he did three pieces of art for us. So we have a quick start kit that we put together. So all the players are going to get the quick start kit. And then after that, Flynn and I need to discuss how we're going to sell it. So, but it's it's cut, it's got the copy of the rules, a basic overview of the game itself, and then it comes with all the characters from the events and the monsters. Well, hopefully when you guys are ready to sell it, we can have you on to talk more juicy details and maybe even bring Flint in, because he's funny. <laughs> he is. So do you have a preferred art style when you when you try to set up this sort of horror-esque um, universe? Like, do you, do you go for the black and white grayscale because it it can add that sort of unknown? Or do you still like the full color? Or? I like, personally, I like full color just because black and white is passe. A passe is my word of the night, so please let me make sure. I tell students, don't say in conclusion in your paper. That's passe. <laughs> but... It's just because everyone does black and white. So you expect, oh, it's a horror game. It should have black and white. I love nice nice shading, you know, nice colors. Livio does amazing. If you've ever seen his art, I don't want to I don't want to go back too far because I'm wearing my unicorn pajamas because I I'm a lazy bum. Oh, that's right. <laughs> unicorn pajamas. Everyone. So Livio did this art. So his color scheme is it's definitely along the line of of like what catches can catch the environment so with subterraleans that's that's like a big thing and when i do my own art like especially the superhero stuff everyone's like your art's really dark like it's dark themed i'm like uh-huh like because that's how everything is i yeah. don't I, I just don't like happy art i like i like art that's not like it's not tropey art either i like stuff that really just catches the the emotion in the moment so that is awesome so is there anything kind of just jumping back a little bit, but um, that you think really, when you're looking at a property going, it needs these things to translate into an RPG well. Kind of reminds me of when I was in grad school and people would come up to me and say, you're a game designer. Will you make my book a game? It's like, well, how does it end? And they're like, I don't know. It's like, well, then it can't be a game. I, pretty much any license or any product that, that you're to, are you going to make it a game has to have, you have to have a conclusion to it. It can't just be, oh, we're not done with it yet. Well, if you're not done with it, I'm not touching it. So if you came yeah. in to be with Star Wars, 
and said, yeah, it's about this kid on a farm that goes into space to fight the bad guys. How does it end? I don't know. Then it can't be a game. That's fair. Then we need to know. Does Luke Skywalker face off with Darth Vader? Does Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, what, what's going to happen here? If you don't know, then I, I can't, I won't touch it. Because you don't want to work on, make a game out of something that's ongoing and, and like changing. So what I found was that like with Subterraleans, like I built everything to a certain point. I told Flint, everything before this, you cannot touch. But I stopped everything, all the histories and everything, at a pivotal moment where you can literally launch off all the things you want to do, they're right there to be done. And you can do prequels and whatever. So everything's been set up that you have all these opportunities, but here are the key points that are set in time, and you can work from this. Because the minute you start changing those little key points, you'll frick up the entire continuity of everything I've done, and then then it won't be it won't be good. So, and I'm not saying it's, it's fantastic either. It's just when you're building an outline, you don't build the outline, build the paper out of order, and then start start changing your main points after the paper's been written because you cause a catastrophe. So, okay, so that's good to know. So, when you're working with existing um, properties. You mentioned one of the things you need from it is the property needs to have an end point. So the story needs to be done. But how do you keep the feel of the universe without making the game so chock full of spoilers that, you know, it ruins the, the other property that it's tied to? Well, in the case like Doctor Who, right? So everything we wrote about had to be cleared by the BBC. But you knew that it was good. something might change later on down the line. Uh, okay, ask your question again. I'm a little tired. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. So how do you keep the so obviously you mentioned that the game or the in order to turn it into a game, the story of the book or whatever has to be finished, right? Oh, without spoilers. Okay. So you can you can still have mystery. So pretty much as a designer, you need to know how it ends, but the player doesn't need to know. That's what the game master section's for. Mm -hmm. So like in Subterraleans, right? It's you know, Flint was out. Flint had talked about the other day. It's like you know about, like you know, the media being like, like basically like Facebook deleting videos and stuff, and YouTube deleting videos and closing accounts on Twitter and whatever. So he's like, what? If, what if they're doing that because people are seeing subterraleans, like they're experiencing events, but the government doesn't want you to know. So that's that's what the players know in the game is. Yeah, weird stuff's going on, but every time we go to talk about it our speech gets stifled and our communication channels get knocked out while the game master knows why that's happening. So what's really going on behind the scenes and like literally subterraleans has an entire section for both of those. What do you, what does the person experience for in the versus what the game master actually knows? So if you're the game master, you just for any game expect to, you know, not, not ever play in this session because you already know all the material. And this won't be as fun for you. Okay. Um, the so normally we ask the um, the authors when we talk to them if they've ever had their books translated into other forms and games is one of them. And since you're a game designer, let's do the reverse. So, have you had any of your independent intellectual properties, i.e., one of your games? Uh, novelized by an author who was like, man, I love this world so much, let me write a novel in it? No, because if, if someone actually went through and read the finer details of the worlds I create, I, yeah, I'd probably, I'd probably, someone would have already probably tried to shoot me by now, so. I think that sure. would be I, a no I, then. The stuff I write is just like brutal. I mean, the very first game I wrote was saying that God was the bad guy and that all the, all the bad stuff happening on Earth was all because God showed up and gave everybody powers. And then to, to try to retcon all that, I'm like, oh, now angels show up and he started killing all the superhumans because they're not part of the divine plan. So, I mean, and people like never, you know, never even blink to it. So I'm like, okay. So either I wrote all this really dark stuff and people are just like, haha, that's just Jay, or they're all twisted bastards and just are really that sick in the head. So I don't know. I, I never what do you know. Think so are they all sick and twisted or they just, it skips by them? Probably just skips by them. And most people, like when I re read role playing games, I skip a bunch of crap. I mean, heck, I, I get the cyberpunk red book in front of me. I haven't even read the whole thing. 
even though I, even though I've written for it and stuff, I, I just don't need to. So, you know, do you have any upcoming releases from your company that you no, want to tell us? I've about? been bogged down with subtrailians. Really okay. Bad. I think I spent the last three or four months now just subtrailians, and then cyber and cyberpunk too, because I had random stuff like get dropped on me. Like you do this, like and have it done like tomorrow. It's like yeah, sure. So, which it's never usually tomorrow. I can get it done in a day, but that's just how. Like when I'm, when when I'm getting paid to do work, I tend to do it very quickly and get it done and get it off my plate so I can get on to other stuff. So, I got nothing. I've got. I've got. I paid good money for a cover for the new G Core 10 year anniversary edition, and I still don't even have it out out to the bookstores yet. So, oops, it's been it's just been crazy. Yeah, you know, I mean, when you're when you're doing stuff, it's like. So, do you have um, any way that listeners can find you on their Jay own? Park, Jay Parker on on Facebook is it? I dumped Twitter a long time ago because it's a toxic toxic cesspool of crap. And I, I just don't need to be around people that are toxic, so I just got rid of it. And then I closed my personal Facebook page down. So <laughs> you just say all these people that friended me like recently, Siska, all of a sudden get the office is closed <laughs> notification on my page, and whatever's on there now is just whatever my wife tags me in. Um, but I run my professional page, um, Jay Parker, and then I have a House of Jay art page, and I have a Deviant art page. But Jay, the Jay Parker page has everything. I mean. Anything I'm doing professionally or any random personal fun stuff like watching classic movies or whatever or kicking my wife's butt at Super Mario Kart, that's where it goes. So, so JR, and how can they find us? I'm glad you asked, Seska. Let me tell you, we <laughs> have our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades. Anchor.fm at um backslash blasters tech and tech blades you can find us on twitter at twitter.com backslash sf underscore fantasy underscore show sierra foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show you can email us at blasters and blaze podcast at gmail.com we promise we jack at least once a week uh, we have a facebook group which is facebook.com backslash blasters and blades podcast you can support the show and help keep the lights on at buymeacoffee.com backslash, uh, backslash author jr hanley and just throw in the comment section it's for the podcast and that'll help keep the stream yards funded and and anything extra we we buy seska more of her drugs wait is it is it drugs i thought it was alcohol i mean alcohol is a drug i sure. prefer chemicals i mean she's our favorite meth dealer oh i got a, i got a great meth story for you oh. okay is it radio well, friendly it's it's radio friendly i well, stationed in, in Cor Corpus Christi, Texas, we're hanging out. One of my shipmates and I were hanging out with these two local girls. And they said, yeah, let's go to this house. And we walk through the door. We get thrown to the floor. And these guys got Uzis in our faces. And they thought we were narcs. And it was a freaking meth house. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. We went out of there and we're like, wow. What was the lesson we learned? No more local girls. Nope. So... Thank you for spending your time with the, your valuable time with us, listeners. On behalf of the donut eating absent Nick Garber, J.R. Handley, and myself, thank you. We will be releasing another show at soon on the same time, same places, um, where we indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and things that go boom. And Satanism. <laughs>